Good morning, everybody, and welcome to uh, the University of Bath's offices here in London. Uh, it's my very great pleasure to and honour to welcome you today for our very first investment breakfast briefing for our scale-up program. My name's Karen Brooks, and I'm the programs director for Set Squared. And uh, it's good to see a few familiar faces in the room that I've seen at some of our other investor showcases that we have had before, which is all good. Um, today's a landmark in Set Squared's history as we move not from just supporting startups, but also to support slightly later stage companies um, that we can bring to you to the investor community which I'm very excited about. Um, but before I tell you a little bit more about the program, um, I just want to tell you a little bit about the agenda so you know what we're going to do today. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, the program and the, about Set Squared. Um, and then I'm delighted that we have today, from his very busy schedule, um, we have uh, Steve Cliff, the CEO of Ultra Haptics, one of our alumni companies. And then we have five exciting companies from our scale-up company from our scale-up program who are all here um, with investment opportunities for you. And then uh, once we have um, finished that part of the formal presentations, all the companies will be in the area which some of you may not have yet found because you were too busy getting. Uh, uh, coffee fueled up with uh, croissants and coffee, but uh, this is like a round area. So if you move to the door that way, you will find the companies after the presentations, and you'll be able to ask them lots of questions after we've had the pitches. So if we um, move through, as I said, there are some familiar faces, but some of you may not know Set Squared um, so well. So I just wanted to tell you a little bit about who we are, for those of you who may be less familiar. Um, Set Squared is the enterprise collaboration of five universities, research intensive universities. And we're focused very much on entrepreneurial training, skills development, um, both on the campus, but in the wider business community as well. And we also um, have spent a lot of time over the last 16 years that we've been in existence in developing and supporting high growth, high tech companies. And to date, that's really been focused on startups, those sort of earliest age seed round companies. And in 2015, we were um, ranked the top business incubator in the world, ranked against over a thousand other incubators. And we've held that um, accolade now um, for twice we have been ranked uh, as the top incubator. So we're very proud of that. Um, and as I say, we've been going for 16 years and we've supported a lot of companies over that time. And something that a lot of people don't realise when they know that we're connected to five universities is that about 80% of the companies that we support in those incubators are from the wider business community. They're not just from the campus. So there's a huge raft of companies and not all just spin-outs. And in even greater number, six and a half thousand of them have participated in our programs. Um, and those are training programs of um, different types. Um, some of them are from the campus and some of them, are, as I say, are from the wider business community. We also incubate companies and we're really about helping them to develop coherent investable business propositions and that's allowed us to raise over one and a half billion investment um, those companies have raised over the last 16 years and an independent study that um, we commissioned last year have um, said that we have contributed a significant value to the UK economy which is just fantastic and we also, that study, looked at what, if we continue to work with these companies and also looking at um, some of the support that we want to do with um, these later stage companies, what impact we'll have in the future. And, 
you know, in just 12 years, that growth will continue and we will be looking at um, more jobs uh, and more economic value. And what we've seen is many rising stars have come through our midst and developed that economic impact. And you're going to hear from one today, um, Ultra Haptics. And there's been many, um, many of them that have come through. And they've been aided by the investment that people in our investor community, people like you, have um, helped those companies to grow and um, create that economic impact. We're also excited about the opportunity that the Scale Up program is bringing us to reach to these later stage companies. And we're really hoping that you'll be part of that success, um, investing in the companies that we support. So in this Scale Up program, what are we looking at um, supporting? Well, we have, um, over three years, we're looking to support 240 Scale Up companies. And how we define Scale Up companies are uh, companies that are established, um, they're, they're potential for rapid growth, they're 10 plus employees, so they're a little bit bigger than the companies that we've traditionally worked with. They've got established products and revenue, ge they're generating revenue, um, and they've got that year-on-year -year growth of 20% or more, as the Scale Up Institute talks about. And they're typically raising between one to two million, but um, as we've uh, begun to bring pro um, companies into the program, we are seeing ones that are actually looking for uh, bigger raises than that. Um, uh, we were talking with one only yesterday that's looking at uh, five to 10 million raises. So it is that Series A, Series B, but even beyond that as well. Um, and I'm pleased to say that I can exclusively say today that we'll be announcing, um, hopefully next week, that um, Cardiff will be joining the program as well. And this will allow us to actually be looking at 280 companies over the three years. So we'll be ex significantly increasing the number of companies that we'll be working with. So you heard it here first, but uh, shh, until we announce it uh, properly out to the market next week. So there's a real opportunity for you as investors, and there's different ways in which you'll be able to engage. We're launching a digital um, marketplace later this year, which will allow investors and corporates to connect with those scale-ups that are part of the program. Um, as we always have done in um, Set Squared, and I think our investor community has appreciated, we do like to provide investor-ready um, uh, companies that have been, um, you know, we've made sure that they are really investable opportunities that we bring to you, and we will continue to do that. And we'll have a regular program of events. Um, this breakfast briefing, as I said, is our first, and we will uh, we have another one scheduled already for the 13th of February, and we'll be looking to hold those regularly throughout the year. So as I say, you can look forward to seeing over um, 280 companies in uh, this program. We already have 40 on the program, and uh, there's currently 10 in the program that are, look, that are currently raising investment, and you're going to see five in a moment today. Um, out of those 40, though, there's probably at least half of them are looking to raise within the next year. So you're going to see a very strong pipeline of companies coming through. And just to show you some of the, a few of the successes that you will have seen from Set Squared, and you may know these companies, um, Zylo recently um, has uh, exited with a deal of, um, it's not been uh, announced exactly how much they've exited for, but it's um, been set around 800 million, um, which is just a, 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 a fantastic achievement and that's been a company that has been with Set Squared all the way through the programs. It started on a campus program called R2I um, and has gone all the way through <coughs> and has now exited. And it's a great opportunity for me to now hand over to um, Steve Cliff who is from Ultra Haptics, is one of our alumni companies who we've worked with um, uh, through the years, and we're really pleased to have here to tell you a little bit more about Ultra Haptics' journey. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
I'm just going to talk today, um, so this is my only slide. Um, so good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for your introduction, Karen. Um, Ultra Haptics um, is almost five years old now. Um, we were formed uh, November uh, 2013, so uh, almost five years old. Um, we started in the engine shed with one desk um, in Bristol. Um, and we've doubled every year since then. Um, and uh, we're 100 people as of yesterday. Uh, we have our, a new CFO as of yesterday. And we, yes, we will double again next year. We expect to be 200 by the end of 2019. So growing, so very much a scale up, very much growing very, very quickly. We're in a constant state of flux and change and so on. Um, so I thought I'd focus my talk this morning on um, uh, how we've made scale up easier for ourselves um, and really it's all about planning because scale up is hard it's you know you know startup is about vision uh, a, a, a mature business is all about maintaining EBITDA but actually growing a, a scale up business and uh, you know actually recruiting being one of the biggest headaches you have is um, makes it very very difficult especially when you're trying to run a business at the same time so I'm going to Couple, cover a couple of uh, topics today. One is people and culture, and for us, this is the the best and easiest way to uh, to create a scale up business. I'll talk about business processes, alignment of uh, founders, board, shareholders uh, uh, together, um, and uh, and in my last slide is or last uh, piece of paper is investors for the journey, not just for Series A. So I'll come on to that uh, in a, in a little bit. Um, to go from you know, one person in one room uh, to 200 people. Um, you've got to recruit, you've got to recruit the right people, and you've got to make sure that the people you get, you keep, because, um, you know, recruiting people is hard, losing them is dead easy. Um, and so you've got to make sure you create a culture that, uh, that makes people want to stay. Um, and yes, you can decide your culture. Um, we actually did it when there was three of us in McDonald's in Bristol uh, about four years ago. Um, and we wanted to create a team environment. We wanted to create an environment uh, where there was no blame. So people will make mistakes. I make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. And it's about not getting really mad with somebody. It's about, okay, that's happened. How do we fix it? How do we move forwards? And where do we want to get to? Um, and actually doing it that way. I have the you know, things do go wrong, and I have had that conversation with a few people. Walked into my office and hit my head on the wall and gone, "You idiot!" But it's about walking the walk, not just talking the talk. So you have to, from the top, make that leadership, and actually don't get angry with anybody at any time, and make sure you keep on top of it. And so, in, on, on top of that, I will, you know, stack the dishwasher. I will pick the rubbish up off the floor, and I you know, and people see me do that, and everybody follows amazing how everybody follows what you do and so it is about making sure that uh, you build a team we also have a rule nobody can eat at their desk at all we built the office around the kitchen and so everybody has to go to the kitchen which was a tradition that started in the engine shed at Brist in Bristol where everybody at lunchtime went downstairs and ate together and we've kept that going and now we have a kitchen that can seat 80 people um, and fundamentally, everybody comes at lunchtime, and it's a real noisy, fun atmosphere to uh, to, to to be to be with it. Um, also, you know, when I said walk the walk and not just talk the talk, um, there's a very book called Walking the Talk by Carolyn Taylor, and I would recommend anybody reads it about building culture within within a business. Um, also important was we got an HR manager, a part-time HR manager as employee number five and a full-time one as employee number 12. And that was to make sure that we got the right people and it wasn't just me doing all the recruiting and, or, or, or whatever, but making sure that we did that and we, the processes were in place uh, going forwards. And of course, you do lose people. Um, we, we've lost five, um, and two for the same reason. And uh, you love this, the most common reason for leaving Ultra Haptics is I'm moving to Canada to live with my girlfriend. We had two of those. And I'm, just, and I'm told by HR that can't be one of my interview questions. Do you have a Canadian girlfriend? So uh, anyway, but that's, uh, it, it is annoying, but it happens, and you have to let th those things go. Um, also, some of the people you have will not come on the journey, the whole journey with you. 
You know, we have, uh, you know, going from two people to 200 people. Some people are comfortable with a 20 person company. Some people are comfortable with 50, you know, some people, you know, some people can't handle a huge amount of people to deal with and, and, and large companies. Um, and so we will, you know, you have to take those tough decisions, have those difficult conversations and say, look, this business is not is not right for you and actually exit them. But we do it in a proper way, in the right way. Um, take time over it, make sure they, they settle somewhere else and then and, and exit it properly. Um, we're not about just firing people and, and shoving them out the door, but we make sure that we've got the right team because at the end of the day, we want the business to be a success and you can't have people who are not right for your business. Um, biggest compliment uh, that was ever paid to me really, and I, I, I like this one, was um, somebody came up to me and said, I've been here two years and I've never heard anybody shout at anybody. And so the cultural thing works and it keeps us as a as a single team. Business processes and growth. Um, always plan ahead. And that's what we plan, 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 plan. We plan two years out, four years out, six years out. We have succession plans for everything. If, some, if we knock one person out, we know what's going to happen if that person disappears. Um, and so we make sure that everything is in place to make sure that that happens and there isn't any business interruption because, um, you know, if it, you, you can't have it going wrong. It has to work. Um, and so, um, you know, and certainly today's decisions can affect your company's outcome at the end. You know, there are no do-overs here. If you get it wrong, you get it wrong. You know, you can't. So let me unspend that money and try that again. You can't do that. And so forth. you've got to keep that to keep that going. Um, and for example, one of the one of the things that we did was, you know, most of our employees are millennials. You know, they're all sort of 20s, 30s um, sort of ages. Um, and, um, you know, we have a very... Uh, we have a, quite a large engineering team of 60 people. Um, they are highly intelligent, highly motivated, um, very skillful at what they do. But when they joined, they hadn't a clue how to write software to go in a car. Um, and so what, what, what I did right at the very beginning was I dragged my old boss, a guy called Barry Dennington, out of uh, retirement. He used to run a team of 600 engineers at Philips. Um, and turned a crack in, you know, a really exciting uh, bunch of young people into a crack engineering squad that could pass an ISO 9000 audit in 18 months. So we passed an ISO 9000 audit when we were 18 months old as a business. Um, and that's because you're setting the, the, the you know, the, the, the path in place to where do you want to get to. We want to sell software and technology to automotive companies going forwards. We've got to have processes in place. And we have to do that. And, you know, we're planning to IPO this business. Um, and so we put everything in place. So, you know, we have a fully up-to-date risk register, which is reviewed and updated quarterly. Um, we have a permanently up-to-date data room. Um, so when it comes to raising money, it's drag and drop. So the processes say every time you sign a, uh, an agreement, hard copy goes there, soft copy goes in that folder. And then when it comes to data rooms, it's literally lifted up and drop it into the Merrill data site. And it takes, what, 20 minutes? And we're done. And so it's managing those things because you know you've got uh, these things to come. And spending a week on getting your data room in order is just stupid if you can do it early on and make sure we, d we move that forwards. Uh, KPMG, audit our accounts. You know, we need three years of audited accounts. We're on our way. And so that's on the way already. We have a REMCOM. We have an audit committee. Um, and fortunately, 40% of our directors have been CEOs of FTSE 250 companies which kind of helps as well because they've all been through it and done it and, uh, made, and, and do make my life somewhat easier. Um, alignment of board, founders, shareholders, and management. Everybody's going to be pulling in the same direction. You know, everybody's got to be going in the same place. Um, you know, in terms of the exit, is it an IPO? Is it a trade sale? Is it a trade sale when the founders have got five million quid each? Is it a trade sale when, you know, the investors have got ten times their money? Um, you know, is it an IPO where nobody sells and everybody wants capital growth? Everybody has to be on the right and same page um, because you can't have somebody say, right, we're selling up now and everybody goes, no, we're not. Um, because then you sort of create tension that doesn't work. Get everybody on the same page at the beginning. And so you've got to have those difficult conversations up front and say, what do you really want out of this? How do you, how do you want to get there? Because if you're not aligned, it will go badly wrong at some point. All the senior management team have to pull together as well. There can only be one agenda for the business, um, and um, you know that has to be in the company's best interests. Um, we can't have little side projects going on. We can't have people going off in different directions. It all has to be for in the best interests of the business. 
and if and that even if it means exiting founders you have to do it to make sure it goes in the right direction fortunately we have some great founders at Ultra Haptics and we we don't have to do that. Um, but, you know, if it needs doing, it needs doing. And investor, and my, my final uh, page really is, investors for the journey, not just for Series A. You know, think long term about your business's cash needs. Um, you know, if you have a Series A at a million pounds and you know, and you know you're going to need a Series D at a hundred million, you've really got to think about, you know, your investors, who they are, uh, will you will they come on the entire journey with you you know you also need to plan your evaluation route you can't you know get too a little you know too aggressive on you know how how much value you want in your series b and c if you get to series d where you need a load of money and you can't get any investors because they won't get their returns you've got to plan that out as well make sure that anybody who comes in at any series has enough return to make sure that it's worth investing in you because you, you'd hate to get Series C, you have a great business and nobody invests because they won't get any the return they need. So you can't, you, you've got to watch that as well. Um, you also got to make sure your articles and investment agreements allow you, your business to thrive and allow you to do all these various rounds and make sure there aren't any constraints that stop you, uh, stop you doing it. And also, don't be afraid to swap out shareholders. Uh, we've done it already. We'll probably do it again. Um, you know, some of the early shareholders, some of the early investors um, may not be able to support Series C, Series D, E, whatever, whatever you get to. Um, and so make sure that um, you know your you know and, and and certainly when you get to Series C, a lot of the early investors may have already made all the money they want to make and actually get out and cash out and move out. But you want in shareholders in there if you've got further rounds coming that can invest further going on. Um, so anyway, that was my sort of four pointers, really, um, in my 10 minutes that I had. So um, if you have any questions, come and talk to me afterwards. But uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Steve. Um, that, that was fantastic. I took down loads of notes. I um, could see lots of other people doing so, too. One of the things you didn't mention, Steve, was your products. And I just wanted to say it takes, as, as people who know me, uh, it takes a lot to make me speechless, but, but uh, Ultra Haptics literally almost left me breathless when I, I saw it for the first time. It, if you get a chance to see what, what they're up to, it's really worth having, having a look at and getting a demonstration. Um, I'm, I'm Jake Roney. I run the investment program on ScaleUp. Um, it's been my great pleasure to work with the companies that you're going to see today, all five of them, a, a cracking bunch. Um, and, um, and they've all kind of come a long way just in a few months in terms of working with the program. So I think hopefully that's a good sign of, sign of things to come. Um, so I think we'll move quite quickly just to start, start, start getting you to see, see the company. So our first um, presenter is Steve Parsons, CEO of Green Gauge Lighting. Oops. I'll move it along for you, Jake. Sorry, Michael. <laughs> Okay, good point. Greetings, everybody. My name's Steve Parsons. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm from. Sorry? Okay. Start again. Hi, Steve Parsons, Green Gauge. Um, and I'm here just to give you an insight in terms of our journey or movement into data analytics and machine learning for the precision agricultural industry and think poultry and swine in terms of this. Um, at the moment, Green Gauge supplies a unique patented induction powered system that allows us to clip uh, LED lights and animal and welfare sensors onto an aerial platform in the shed and then on that platform our business model is moving is then we have the ability to extract data out, put it into the cloud and then use predictive analytics to drive uh, extensively productivity and animal welfare improvement in, in the industry. Um, we located in Scotland at the Rosland, we were yet we, re we located in Scotland at, uh, as a spin-in uh, to the Roslyn Innovation Centre um, and we decided to do that because we wanted to get close to a centre of excellence for animal science and, and welfare. I think you know, one of the primary things that drives this industry is without a doubt is we know and everybody's heard the statistics that there are 7 billion going to 9 billion miles at this point in time and protein consumption is driven by a demand for this and we will see that in the next 30 years just to stand still uh, animal production has to double just to meet that demand so the demand dynamic for white meat is strong 
However, within that, we find that the pressure on farmers today is a number of things, but pressure being driven by a typical and operating margins, and energy is around the third biggest cost. There's huge demand and social pressure around animal welfare criteria, and of course, we've spoken about that productivity has to go up. So, pressure is there. By using our system to date, we have uh, run a scientific trial with the University of Edinburgh, and they have shown that using our lights, we will generate around a 50% improvement in terms of operating cost against legacy lighting systems. At the same time, it now the, under the lights, it will generate an improved natural behavior from the bird under the, in the shed, and good preening, locomotion, and activity helps for productive animals. And then last but not least, the same study showed that there was a mortality rate improvement under the lights. Now, if you adopt all of that technology, for a simple farmer, that equates to about a 12 to 18 month payback on his capital. And if the industry put it all together and used it, we think there's about a $3 billion saving to the industry. It's a great opportunity. So what we have is we have a patented technology stack, so both in terms of the power and the lights and the sensors, the hardware base. We have 26 patents across five families. And then that allows us then to put the data analytics around where we're looking to this early disease detection capability. Now the size of the prize, I mean the numbers are staggering. This industry at the moment there are 40 million lights, about 8 million sensors, driving 60 billion broilers, about 6 billion laying hens, and a billion pigs, which means your real estate is anywhere between sort of 600 and 750,000 sheds that need this technology. So if you equate that in terms of money, that's about a $3 billion market things, and if you add both the data analytics and the sensors, that doubles it up to about $6 billion. To date, we have uh, 2,500 sheds in play uh, in 12 countries. We've got five beachhead customers in key locations from the UK, US, and Australia. And we have in track around 5 million sales to date. And we've just recently secured to date the largest integrator in the UK and maybe Europe, 1,200 sheds of refit for their whole estate which will take us three years to do, and that's worth about six million pounds. So it puts us on track to double our turnover over the next couple of years. If you think about how we are moving our model, uh, we are moving it out of the hardware to the, to the software, the sales and service, which is the expectation would be is that you see our revenue kind of changing from being 100% CapEx to 50-50, and then the corresponding margin will increase from 30 to 50% gross margin. The money's all about the data analytics, we have animal welfare and we have to build our capability of within that uh, within the team ah the rogues gallery um, we have some good sector experience um, both in terms of the team and the board so we get a support, good support on that and to date we have invested or we received uh, money to date worth 7.1 million uh, Pounds. We're looking for a raise of 3 million and we've already got 1.5 million raised and we're now looking for additional investors for the last one and a half around the data analytics. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, fascinating technology and the uh, interesting um, happy chicken index we were discussing last yeah. night, which is you know, the kind of output from the analytics and study, studying how the livestock uh, are, are getting on. Um, so our next, uh, next presenter is uh, Mark Ive, CEO of, of Rescom. Mark. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Great. So uh, my name is Mark Ive. I'm the CEO of uh, Rescom. Uh, Rescom provides advanced e-commerce and CRM systems to the airport sector. Uh, I thought I'd begin just with our mission statement. I won't read it verbatim, but essentially we want to become global leaders in, uh, in what we do. Um, the problem we're solving, so uh, about 50% of airports across the world are, are actually losing money. Um, airports need to increase their non-aviation revenues uh, to trade sustainably, and that's where we come in. Um, they have a very poor digital online experience typically and they, they have disparate systems in their airports that aren't joined up and are very costly to maintain. Um, subsequently they're unable to connect with their passengers uh, and to, to sell them more products um, and other online resellers are basically taking market share um, and the tail is subsequently wagging the dog. 
Um, how do we meet the airport's needs? So um, we provide a, a, a sort of a joined up ecosystem, a digital ecosystem that basically collects all the data from the airport uh, and uses that to increase revenue and engage with the customer. Um, it enables the airport to connect with the customer throughout their, their journey throughout the airport um, and it promotes the right product to the right customer at the right time. Um, it's, it's out of the box, so it's tried and tested. There's no large capex cost for the client and it's very cost effective. It's offered as a sort of a page you go model. The proven benefits, uh, there's actually quite a lot. We've, we've increased non aviation revenues for our partners by over 100%. Um, we've increased the database of the airport very significantly and we've reduced their distribution costs um, by millions every year. Um, we provide them the tools they need to connect with their passengers and to re regain their market share and also to grow the lifetime value of the customer. So on a 30 million passenger airport that's worth about 130 million pounds. Um, ultimately also delivers a, a better improved um, customer experience and uh, increases the average transaction, transaction value for the, for the airport. The product itself is a unique combination of e-commerce, CRM, analytics, um, it, it essentially is a marketplace for the airport to sell any product, a flight ticket, a hotel, a parking space, a lounge. It connects the, the customer with um, the retailers in the airport, the concessions, which is very, very important for them. Um, and it enables them also to, to yield um, on all of the products that they sell. So a bit like an airline would for a flight ticket. Uh, it also helps build that uh, all important uh, customer loyalty. The, our business is very agnostic in, in terms of how we operate um, and it's very scalable. We've got over 100 integrations to date and that's almost growing monthly with some um, big corporations. And in terms of our own traction, we work with just over 25 airports across the UK and Europe. Uh, we generate about £65 million pounds of annual income for our partners. That's about 1.5 million transactions a year. Um, we send over 50 million uh, marketing emails every year and we have framework agreements in place with some pretty big players in the market, Vinci Airports with 37 airports in their group, and actually more recently a global park and operate with 5,007 locations around the globe. Um, we've got about 50% market share of the UK airports, 100% um, market share um, w with in, in terms of Portugal, um, and we've got a foothold in France, Germany, and Switzerland. So the opportunity, um, we've identified 1,200 commercial airports around the globe, which we've mapped and we've sized, but um, the beauty of our product is that it's very portable across other industries. So parking operators, uh, municipalities, local authorities, um, transportation hubs, so railway stations, ports, service stations, um, stadia arenas, and, and even shopping malls. Uh, the commercial model is very straightforward. It's a, a transaction fee on every purchase through our platform. Um, for the travel products that we sell, we receive a commission, so if we set a flight ticket or a hotel, we earn a commission that way. We see a natural uplift in our revenue as also the airport's passengers grow, and airports are going around about 7 to 8% year on year in terms of their passenger traffic. Um, our top sort of user of our system so far is generating about £120,000 in recurring income for us. Um, and when all of our products and services are combined and are used together to great effect, again we see a natural uplift in our revenue. We have a fantastic team, a uh, great board. Our chairman is Lord Ewan Cameron of Dillington. He's a cross at the House of Lords. Our founder is a serial entrepreneur in the travel industry. I've been in the industry for about 25 years um, within travel technology. Um, our parking services director is the ex-CTO of a very large parking operator in the UK. And our director of digital um, used to work for a very large digital agency in the UK. And we're supported by 13 very, very keen and ambitious uh, colleagues. Uh, the history of the company, we started in 2006 as an online travel agency. Uh, in 2013, we launched our first e-commerce platform. Um, today, we've invested about a million pounds into the business. That's really to, to see us through to where we are today. Um, lots of, of, of has gone into sort of the research and development phase um, and positioning our company in the industry. Uh, 2018, we'll see our revenues increase to 1.2 million. Uh, we get about a 20% year-on-year average growth. Um, and in 2019, we're projecting uh, annual revenues of 1.45 million. So why do we need the investment? Well, we want to accelerate and go global. Um, we'd like to raise three million pounds to, to do that, um, to increase our income to 10 million by 2024. Um, 
We'll use that money primarily to, to land grab, um, to go into key territories, the US, Asia, and to expand further in Europe. Um, that will also see us open an office in the US. Um, and we'd like to rapidly increase our brand awareness across those key territories. Um, another key thing for us is also to accelerate our, our uh, development cycle with particular focus on the AI um, artificial intelligence. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, we were describing uh, them as uh, Amazon for airports the other day, so I, I kind, of, kind of like that, that, that description. Um, over to um, Nick Dolman now, our founder and chairman of, of Check Risk, to tell, tell us about, about what they're up to. Thank you, Jake. Um, I'll do that. So, good morning. Uh, thanks to the University of Bath and Set Squared for uh, hosting the event. I'm Nick Bullman, founder and chairman of uh, Check Risk. I'm here with Hugh Bunn, our director of strategy, who's also a partner. I and my team are absolutely passionate about risk and the fact that the risk industry is uh, primed and ready for destruction. I have a confession. I have six children, so clearly my risk management hasn't always been up to par. I have worked out what's causing it, and uh, it's partially fueling my interest in uh, looking at why risks occur. Risk is perhaps the least understood influencer in modern life. Check Risk has created a risk ecosystem of products that solve that problem. Uh, there are three things that our ecosystem essentially do. Uh, provides positional awareness. That's one of the key factors of discovering risk. Dynamic changes to that positional awareness and then the pricing of risk in a number of different formats. Our company ma mantra is risk rewarded. Um, and essentially what we're doing is, is working out the question, am I being paid to take the risk or not? Uh, this is our uh, proprietary risk ecosystem. You can see um, it's not just for financial services. It actually covers enterprise risk and a number of other risks. All of our algorithms have been built in conjunction with the University of Bath and the University of Bristol, whom, with whom we continue to work very closely. Um, we're answering financial risk problems at the moment, but they have much broader applications. So enterprise risk, risk conduct, and risk measurement are all issues that need to be addressed um, around the world. Our products are designed to be interactive with each other and surpass all regulatory standards. Um, this is a real risk ecosystem. Uh, some of our clients, um, we've developed a number of products for Aegon, Willis, Friends First, Medialanum. We're uh, signing up a number of uh, new clients at the moment. Um, our business is really a disruptor. The um, 16 billion credit rating agency market is a market that is filled by four uh, major companies who are really very, very sleepy and guilty, potentially, of creating the 2008 credit crisis. Um, a big differentiator about Check Risk is our products are designed to help our clients through a financial crisis, not create them. Uh, wider still, a uh, 13 billion market of uh, risk management um, products out there. Uh, we've got um, a number of existing clients, as you can see. Essentially, what we're doing is transitioning to a uh, SaaS company at the moment. Uh, if you could, I'm just going to do the breakout here. You'll see one of the products there, Bank Fox. Um, here it's a demo. Essentially, this was a product we designed for Aegon and that we're now rolling out across um, about 10 banks who are looking to sign up. Um, it's a product that looks at network risk. Banks don't go bust because of credit. They go uh, bust because of liquidity. So it's essential to understand what are the interrelationships of your portfolio of banks if you're an insurance company, a bank, or a global treasurer. Uh, we developed this for Aegon, as I said. We created about four basis points of improvement in profit for them and a four basis point reduction in risk. That equated to uh, £400,000 of additional uh, profit on their uh, treasury portfolio on a £1 billion uh, portfolio of assets. Uh, had we been able to uh, create the portfolio from scratch, we think we could have got that up to about 16 basis points or £1.6 million. Um, we've been shortlisted for the Treasurer, uh, Treasurer's Leaders Summit 2018 Innovation Award in November, and we'll come back if we uh, are placed or win. Um, current traction, well, we're now in the process of signing heads of agreements with a major insurance company who's moving into private wealth management, and they will be using our early warning risk system and uh, also be looking at um, uh, uh, developing... Um, 
developing other business with us uh, on, on the asset management side. That will generate about 750,000 in revenues this year and will be 2 million plus uh, per year uh, by 2022. We're forecasting revenues of 25 million by 2022 and profits in the region of 17 million. We're actually profitable as it stands. Uh, we made 178,000 profit last year. That'll drop this year just because of our SaaS conversion and then progress on as you can see. Um, we're looking for 2.35 million in investment. Uh, that'll be used for product development and maintenance, HR expansion, continued R&D, and uh, putting in place comprehensive IP protection. And finally, our board, um, all, uh, Hugh and I have built businesses and sold them uh, uh, in the past very successfully. And we also have some outstanding leaders on the board. Uh, Hugh Graham was uh, CEO of Zurich Bank and uh, CRO, CRO of uh, AIA group, uh, and then we have a mix of academics in the business um, as well. So finally, uh, risk rewarded, it's check risk. Uh, we think we are the disruptive industry or business for the risk industry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Um, exciting uh, business. I actually mentioned it to a friend of mine who's head of risk at one of the big banks. Been there for nearly 30 years. No sign of uh, ever changing. I told him about the product and said, oh, never mind buying it. Um, have, have they got any jobs going? So um, <laughs> good, uh, good recommendation. Um, uh, we're next, next going to hear from Mike Adams, um, CEO at Haita Technologies. Hi. I'm Mike Adams. Um, I'm going to talk about. Use the mic. Okay. Hi, I'm Mike Adams. I'm CEO and uh, one of the founders of um, High Eighty Technologies. So, High Eighty Technologies um, is essentially a company that works with additive manufacturing, which is industrial 3D printing, um, and we work with metals. And uh, essentially, our core market is in energy systems. Um, we've been going for uh, about seven years. We're currently going to turn over this year some, something between four and four and a half million. Um, we are in the stage of uh, we're now cash neutral and we're moving into profit. So that we are a classic scale up uh, opportunity. So what we're um, doing really is um, working in an emerging technology. So everybody hears about 3D printing and, and technology, but actually seeing it um, commercialized is actually the next step and that's essentially what we do for our clients so we have a number of clients now so um, we started off doing a lot of R&D whereas now we're running 22 commercial projects um, and we're moving into that stage so we're currently looking to uh, raise three to five million pounds um, like the other guys we're using that fund funds to um, focus in onto the um, start up, uh, the scale up phase, but also to expand into um, export markets. So we're currently doing uh, projects in um, most of Europe, uh, Japan, um, and America. So what is it we do? So thermal engineering products doesn't sound very sexy. So if you think about it, um, what it is, is, is big heat exchanges. And we make them, our unique selling point is that we make them almost a fifth of the size that they currently exist. Now imagine you're flying that, or that's part of your car. And you can see some examples in the left here. So we, we would take an existing product that might be 15 litres and actually reduce that to four. Now if you're a car manufacturer, that's quite a significant thing. Imagine you're um, an aeroplane manufacturer and actually you're taking that weight out of the uh, aircraft. Very, very important. So we can potentially reduce most of these things down to 80%. If you look just below the, the kind of gray um, elements, what you can see is you can see the, um, oh. So how do we do this? So we did set this, there you go. So in the bottom, you're actually seeing what actually 3D printing is, which is lasers uh, effectively um, melting powder, creating an image, which then um, you'll see in a minute, the powder will come across and it will start again. But just below those um, gray symbols, you'll see that um, we are actually at the point that we have used this technology and these are real products. So if you think about markets like aerospace and automotive, they're always saying that it's a long time to the market. We've already been through that, and we're actually now have the, the products ready to be commercialized and sold. Our second um, 
what we would call unique selling point is that actually uh, we're one of the few companies in the world who offer the complete supply chain. So people will sell you AM machines, uh, they'll make bits for you, but we actually take the whole product design cycle right the way through to when it's commercialized. So for a lot of people who are looking at getting into this technology, that is a huge risk um, mitigator. Because to go out and do this and find people in this new technology that nobody understands, to find machines that work and do it at the cost, is, uh, takes a long time and is hideously expensive. Whereas they can work with us and we can take a product um, all the way to the point where they're ready to commercialize it. Um, and that's our model. So we have uh, 50 engineers who are um, capable, everything from uh, CFD, thermal analysis, through to the manufacturing people at the end. So in terms of revenues and markets, when we talk about um, heat exchanges, what you have to understand is the heat exchanger market is worth 20 billion pounds. Now, $20 billion by 2022, AM or 3D printing is going to be worth $6 billion by uh, the beginning of the 20s. So what we do is we design these products to use this technology to maximize the opportunity. Um, and these, we have something like 15 um, patents um, already signed, and we have 15 in the, um, in the process of being approved. So we are looking for industrial Focus, uh, manufacturing focused um, investors who, once again, will be supporting this for the long term. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, going, to, going to the factory is like a vision of the future. It's, it's, uh, it's not a factory like anyone I've seen, which is kind of grotty and bits floating around. <laughs> like a clean room, more like a chip fab. Um, it's uh, well worth going to see. Um, so uh, last of our presentations, um, we've got Gareth Williams, CEO and founder of Yellow Dog. Good morning, my name is Gareth Williams. I'm the founder of Yellow Dog. We're building a world where people can do more, create more, innovate more, to be, uh, to be unleashed from their limited computing power. So did you know that according to Gartner, the average server utilization in an enterprise is only between 5 and 15%. They also say that 30% of servers that are installed in data centers are turned on and they're never used. And yet, in financial services, customers are telling us they're finding it really hard to keep up with the increasing demands placed on them by regulators, shareholders, and stakeholders. We understand that they want answers to questions now, not in eight hours' time. We understand that they're under increasing pressure to deliver results faster and faster than ever before. And yet, the data is getting bigger, their models more complex, the regulatory requirements more stringent and onerous than ever before. Yellow Dog can help them deliver those answers faster than ever before. Our platform enables businesses to, secure, to accelerate the processing of big batch processes, fast enough to turn overnight processing into minutes processing and all without them having to spend an extra penny on additional hardware. Our unique technology enables them to securely harness the underutilized servers that already exist within their organization and use those to accelerate those big batch, pro back, big batch processes. And if that's not enough for the workload, at, uh, for the jobs at hand, Yellow Dog can be configured by them to securely burst those workloads out to the cloud providers that they select. Yellow Dog is more flexible than virtualization. It's more resilient than high performance computing clusters. It's less expensive than hyperconvergence. And we are naturally vendor agnostic. Now, as well as the tens of millions of pounds that these customers can save um, on hardware that they no longer need to buy, the reduction in risk, the improvements in decision making create a compelling business case. In fact, for one global bank, the reduction in risk um, and the year one benefit has, has been calculated at $90 million. Now, for the past two and a half years, we have been revolutionizing and disrupting the media and entertainment market, where we've been helping animation studios and visual effects facilities all over the world render computer-generated imagery faster than ever before. We help their artists to do more, to create more, to deliver against seemingly impossible deadlines. And we do that by taking their business critical, highly sensitive data, securely transferring it to our platform, segmenting it, and then processing it faster than ever before. 
This has enabled us to build a growing business. This year we're seeing 236% growth. So far we've raised £2.8 million from the crowd, from angel investors and from our first VC. And we're now 24 people spread across uh, sales, marketing and technology functions. We're now raising three to five million pounds to help achieve three things. The first is to help us continue to scale our rendering business and to do that by establishing um, sales and marketing operations in uh, North America and in India, the two other big markets for, this, uh, for, for the media entertainment business. The second is to scale our financial services uh, business from the successful proof of value projects that we're already delivering. And in fact, we signed up our first financial services customer last week. And the third is to extend our product into aerospace, where we're now seeing some of the world's largest um, aerospace companies approaching us to see how we could help them uh, with their large computational tasks. We're building a world class team here at Yellow Jamie, oh, and all this. This investment is to help to build us to a 33 million pound business by 2021. It's big growth. Um, our world-class team, so Jamie, our head of sales, um, has spent the last 15 years in companies from Ernix to Brightside and MoneyHub, where he's helped banks and insurance companies solve the most complex problems with the latest technologies. Simon um, has spent the last 20 years building secure, scalable, and energy efficient applications that are now in use by millions of people across the world. He's been Chief Architect and uh, Chief Technology Officer at Flexion, Cloud Direct, um, and SunGuard. He's filed over 30 patents, nine of which have been granted. And I, I love building products that solve real problems. And I've done that in companies from Orange to Experian QAS and to Ariso, where I was one of the management team that achieved a successful exit in 2013. We're building a great business. And if you'd like to help people do more, create more, to innovate more, to be unleashed from their limited computing power, then come and find me and Simon afterwards. We can then book a slot to see how, as an investor, we can help you make millions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gareth. Um, it's an amazing business, and just sort of think about how you disintermediate uh, industries that seem to have it all done. So along comes someone who gets them in between you and that cloud provider that was maybe taking taking an awful lot of your uh, your cost base up. Um, so I think we were talking last night about whose lunch are we stealing, and um, we've got, got good good ideas there about a few people who should be worried about what Yellow Dog are doing. Um, so that wrap, wraps up the presentations. Um, just thank you to the companies, um, not just for doing great presentations today, but for being a pleasure to work with over the last few months and to, um, for all the hard work getting to this point. Um, and to all the people who've come today, um, hopefully you'll kind of go now and meet the companies and start talking about how you can be part of their future. Um, I'd just like to thank the team who've put all this together. Um, so for, for, from uh, Karen, but we've got Serena, Emma, Joanna, Rose, Hugo, Chloe, Mike, a few others I suspect I've forgotten, but and obviously um, um, it's, it's uh, been, been a real kind of uh, experience for us to put this, this first, first event together. Now, if I can make this work. I think we've got, oh, just last things. I'm not sure if they've got the slides right. Probably not, no, me. Um, we've got two other events coming up. We've got our next um, event, which just want to thank KPMG. Um, last night we had a great dinner, which was hosted at their fabulous offices um, just around the corner. If you ever get an invite, do go. Um, and they, they <laughs> they're uh, kind of going to host, host our next event um, in February, February the 13th. So um, we'll be sending out invitations to that quite soon. Um, and we also have a, a startup event on the 5th of December, um, which I think you may have already had some invites to. Um, so if you're interested in some of those companies as well, then do sign up for that. Um, so thank you very much to everybody and um, look forward to mingling with you for, for the rest of the event. Thank you.